Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship. Very special welcome to any who are perhaps worshiping here for the first time, any visitors who are with us. Uh, you know, we have some visitors again from Canada, so a warm welcome. And you'll see in our worship this morning, we are going to administer the sacrament of baptism to Hunter Lavery. We particularly welcome Hunter, his big sister Abby, his family and his friends who have joined with us this morning. A warm welcome. At the close of our worship, come and join us for uh, coffee, which is served outside the, the West Hall. The church notices are, are there as, as printed. You'll see this, uh, this week there's the handbell choir practice on February the 6th, and we do have a, a Bible, well, it's January the 30th, and then February the 6th, that's a Tuesday evening, and our Bible study group meets on the Wednesday evening, and that's in the West Hall. Um, two further uh, notices just draw to your attention that, that no one, in fact, has yet signed up for Flowers for Church for February, so if you'd like to do that, uh, either in memory for someone or just to, to donate flowers, that would be very welcome. The, the list is outside the, 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 the hall, I think it's there. And other piece of news for you is that our sexton, uh, Randy Bababack, is going to be leaving us at the end of February. Randy's been here, and his wife have been here on the island for 31 years and have decided it's time to return home to the, to the Philippines. And he's been sexton here for the last 14 years. Uh, so end of February is, is when he will leave us. Uh, I think we all appreciate the work that he has done over these 14 years. So on the last Sunday of February, which will be his last Sunday, it's proposed that there should be a presentation to him. And if you'd like to contribute to that, you can either do so online by indicating that it's for that purpose or by giving a donation again with Randy's name on it and an envelope in our, in our offering um, as our sort of appreciation for all that he has done over these last 14 years. We will, of course, be moving to advertise uh, for a, a successor to, to Randy. Let us worship God, let us sing to his praise from the Psalms and at hymn number 50. The praises of our Lord, our God, hymn number 50. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise, to join with your whole church in heaven and on earth in proclaiming your goodness, acknowledging you as creator and sustainer of all. We give thanks that you are a God not remote, distant and uninvolved, but to be found at the very center of our lives and in the center of this your creation, through the promptings of your Holy Spirit, revealing your nature and your ways to us 
through the prophets of old, the saints of the church, but above all in the person of Christ. His sharing in our lives, in human joys and human sorrows, in times of thanksgiving and celebration, in times of loss and of sadness. Our experiences are known to you. You care for us. You surround us with your love. And through your spirit, you direct us in the ways of truth and of life. But too often we turn from these very ways and go our own, causing harm to ourselves, to others, and letting you down in all that you have asked of us. And so before you now, we ask forgiveness. And as we ask your forgiveness, we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of those we have let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults and the failings of the past and that sense of guilt that accompanies them. Free us into the present and into the future that we may better discern your presence in our midst, listen again to your ways and all you ask of us, and grow closer to you, that we might also grow closer to one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we move to the sacrament of baptism and the baptismal hymn, I wonder if the children would like to come down to the front and, uh, and join in this, in this sacrament. Um, Hunter's big sister, Abby, is part of CCY, so why don't you come and join with her? Um, as we administer the sacrament of baptism. Would you like to give out the words of the baptismal hymn? Yeah, me. There we go. Would like to help give these out? There we are. Give these out. We sing the baptismal hymn in 631, a little child the Saviour came, the mighty God was still his name, in 631. Please be seated. Our authority for the sacrament of baptism is given in the words of Jesus to his disciples after his resurrection, when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the close of the age. What Jesus told his disciples to do then, we seek faithfully and joyfully to do today. In baptism, God declares that we are all his children through Christ, that our future lies with him through the Holy Spirit, and that the church is the place where we will learn to serve him in the world. The sacrament of baptism is a symbol of God's love for us and his grace to us. Parents come giving thanks for the gift of a child, of new life, recognizing God as the creator of all life. They come seeking God's blessing on their child, recognizing his blessing on all children, on all life and indeed in all creation. And they come making commitments and taking vows, but recognizing first and foremost God's commitment to us through his love for us and his constant presence with us. Let us pray. Blessed be God, our Father, the Creator. Blessed be God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Blessed be God, the Spirit, the Lord, and the Giver of life. Grant to us, eternal God, the living presence of the risen Christ within this sacrament. Bless this water and fulfill your promise given at Pentecost that this child being born again of water and the Holy Spirit may be made part of your new creation, united forever with Christ as a member of the church, his body, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hunter, Liam, Alexander, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain with you always. Amen. You going to come to me? There we go. According to Christ's commandment, Hunter, Hunter Liam Alexander Lavery is now received into full membership of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and is engaged to confess the faith of Christ crucified and risen. Amen. I'll give you back to mum. There we go. We stand to sing the blessing in your orders of service. The Lord bless you and keep you. Please be seated. In baptism has symbolized God's love for us and his commitment to us. Little children do not understand these things now, but God's promises do not depend on age and understanding. He comes to them through his word and through his spirit, working in the lives of their parents and all who know and love them. But it is the parents whom he calls most clearly to help him in his work. The parents, therefore, please stand.
and take their vows. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Do you promise with God's help to bring this child up as a Christian, to teach him by word and example what this means, and to bring him up within the life and the worship of the church? The Lord bless you and enable you faithfully to keep these vows. The sacrament not only brings you the joy of Christ's presence in your midst, but also lays solemn obligations upon you, the people of God. Will you be faithful to your calling as members of the church, so that this child and all other children in our midst may grow up in the knowledge and in the love of God? And will you signify your renewed commitment to this calling by rising and standing in your places? Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this child in whom you have shown us again the meaning of our faith and the signs of new life. Lead him forward now to live secure and free in the power of the risen Christ. Guide and keep the family to whom you have given him and give to them a sense of your love and grace. And touch us all with the promise of this sacrament that the old ways in us have lost their power and that in Christ we are being made to rise above our failures and to set our feet upon the path of new life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We present to Hunter his baptismal certificate and also his book, first book of Bible, that first Bible in prayers. And we'll stay standing for a blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here this day, may they go with your blessing, knowing your love that surrounds them. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship with our readings from Scripture, first from the book of Deuteronomy and then the response of Sam, which you'll actually find in your hymnaries at hymn 72. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. The first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, from verse 15 to verse 20 and you'll find it on page 174 in the Old Testament section of the Bible in the pew. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Now we'll read together Psalm 111. Uh, which is uh, in the hymn book at page, uh, hymn 72. Alleluia, 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the faithful and in the congregation. His work is full of majesty and honor, and his righteousness endures forever. He gave food to those who feared him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He the works of his hands are truth and justice. All his commandments are sure. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Amen. Today's gospel is the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1 and at verse 21, page 35 in your New Testaments. Mark, chapter 1 and at verse 21. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. I discovered at the eight o'clock service that you didn't know the first hymn, hymn number 50. I have no sympathy for you. It's been in the Scottish Psalter since 1635. But you do know this one, hymn 160, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The passage we read from the book of Deuteronomy is part of what's described as the, the final discourse of conversations between Moses and his, and his people before his death and his handing over to his successor, Joshua. Of course, it was actually written some 600 years later in the, in the 6th century, although it's dealing with events, as I say, these hundreds of years earlier. And so in a sense, it, it reflects what has happened in that intervening period of, of 600 years, and particularly in terms of the, the promise that a prophet would be appointed. Because Moses tells them or, that a prophet will be appointed from, or, from within their own people uh, who will lead them. And so when we read this passage, it's really reflecting the fact not just on one prophet that was appointed, but on all the prophets that had acted on God's behalf through these intervening centuries. Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah. So a prophet will be appointed, can really be read of prophets will be appointed. But over the course of time, it began to be read in the, in the singular and took on the notion of being a sort of messianic figure who wasn't just at times a kingly figure, but was also a, a, a prophetic figure. And the prophet had essentially three roles. The prophet, like Moses, if you remember him going up Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb to receive the commandments, the prophet really stood between God and human beings. He was a sort of intermediary. The second role of the prophet was to receive God's revelation, his divine word. He was a receiver of that message. And the third function that he had was to take that message and not keep it to himself, but to share it with his people. And when that had been done, then the prophet's role, if you like, was fulfilled, and it was up to his listeners to decide how they would respond, and we're told in the passage that they would be held accountable. Because we're also told in that passage that there would be false prophets, and again that's reflecting the history between the time of Moses and the time of the exile, when we know that the people of Israel frequently, during these centuries, recognized and worshipped other gods, the gods of Baal, the Canaanite gods. And so it's so not just a warning, but a, a past reflection on, on what had actually happened. And a warning not just to worship the false gods and to listen to false prophets, but also a warning not to fail in the listening to, listening to what the genuine prophets were proclaiming. And we'll come back to that. But we turn briefly to our gospel passage and Jesus in the synagogue at Capernaum. A strong thrust of Mark's gospel is his emphasis on the fact that Jesus taught with authority. His teaching had, a, had authority. It's curious that in Mark's gospel, in comparison to Matthew's or Luke's gospel, he doesn't actually tell us very much of what that teaching was. And in this particular passage, we know nothing about it. But what he does is he, he kind of interjects in the middle of this statement about Jesus teaching with authority, this exorcism of a, of a man possessed of an unclean spirit. The spirits, we're told, recognize with whom they are dealing, but his power is greater than theirs. And so the, the man is, is healed, the spirit is, the demonic spirit is, is dismissed. And in the back of that, people further recognize the authority which Jesus carried with him. It would be easy to simply say, well, nowadays in the 21st century, we don't really believe in, in sort of demons and, and sort of demonic persuasion. What we do recognize is that just in Jesus' time, there are those factors of human life which are destructive of that human life. And it seems to go in different gradations. It can be from simple wrongdoing to acts of behavior that seem to arise out of dislike and beyond that even to enmity to acts that really seem to be the very sort of personification of, of evil. So while we might not believe in demons 
possessing people in the 21st century. We do indeed acknowledge the wrongdoing and even the evil which we see in our world today. And perhaps an example just this weekend, when we read of 100 killed and goodness knows how many injured in that bombing in Kabul, when an ambulance of all things, an ambulance is driven into a busy part of the city and, and detonated and, and over 100 killed by in the Taliban of, of claimed responsibility, but done in, in the name of, of religion and ad, advancing their particular cause. And it brings me back to what lay at the heart of the sort of prophetic proclamation. What it was they heard in terms of the divine word and what it was they sought to pass on to their listeners. And it was in a sense a vision, a vision of how life could be and, and should be. And it was a vision also, always of a creation of harmony and unity and a sense of peace and a sense of justice. That, that was the vision. That was the true prophetic vision. And when one is asked to distinguish between the true and the false prophets, then what we find that belongs to the true prophets is their criticism of injustice and the lack of righteousness, a lack of peace and the lack of harmony in human society, within their people, and indeed within all creation. There was no sense of a message of division or enmity. True prophecy had these features at its heart. And of course, it doesn't just belong to the prophets of the Old Testament. We find at different times in the church's history, people of, of vision. And, and what was that vision? I'm going to reflect just for a few moments on the vision of the great Scottish reformer, John Knox. Every day in entering New College of Edinburgh University, we had to pass a statue of him in the, in the quadrangle, one hand pointed to heavens, the other hand holding the Bible. What was Knox's vision as he wanted to create nothing less than the new Jerusalem within Scottish society? Well, you know, vestiges of it remain down to the present day and to this very weekend. Because in Stornoway, in the Isle of Lewis today, on the Sabbath, for the very first time, the cinema is going to be open. And the church, the free church, is up in arms. Because this is not something you do in the Sabbath. You do not go to the cinema. You do not involve yourself in games or leisurely pursuits. Um, the swimming pools run by the local authorities are all closed. And it was only in recent years that they stopped chaining up the swings in the swing park to avoid children playing in them. These are vestiges of, of Knox's Scotland uh, of, the, of the 17th century. It was uh, not a very joyful time. We tend to forget that part of his vision was to completely destroy any remnants whatsoever of the church life of the Catholic Church that had gone before. That included getting rid of, of bishops, uh, of vestments. It involved the destruction of churches, of cathedrals, of monasteries and abbeys. It involved the destroying of all stained glass that was any of the churches, the tearing down of, of any statues, and a very different form of worship. That was part of Knox's vision of the new Jerusalem. Yes, of course, there were the positive elements his desire to see in every Scottish parish a school so that all children would have access to at least a rudimentary education. And that in turn, in time, was to lead to the, some of the great figures of the Enlightenment and all that they contribute, not just to Scottish society, but to the wider world. But when we follow through Knox's vision and see the apparent lack of, of joy and joyfulness in it, Although I have great difficulty reconciling that picture with the account of him presiding over a communion service in which the congregation consumed eight and a half gallons of claret. <laughs> and I can't quite bring these together, but so it, so it is recorded. But certainly, as we follow through Knox's followers and all that came to be, we find the horrendous example of the late 17th century when four young men were passing the relatively newly built Tron Kirk 
uh, in the, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. And one of them, a young student, hardly 19, a theology student, was sort of poking fun a little bit with his colleagues, maybe to a degree slightly showing off, but poking fun at some of the doctrines of the, of the Christian faith. And one of his four colleagues reported him to the authorities. And he was duly arrested and imprisoned. And eventually it went to trial. And the procurator asked for the death sentence. And it actually created a, a debate which went beyond Scottish society and into English society as well as people took up different positions. Those arguing from a what was seen as a more secular point of view, that this was just a, a, a young man and it should be understood for what it was. And on the other side, the religious reformers, including Tom Halliburton, who was to become the professor of divinity at St. Andrews University, pressing for nothing less than the death sentence as an example. And in January 1697, at the age of 19, young Thomas Aikenhead was hung from the gallows. So it makes one reflect on vision. What was the vision? What is a true vision which seems to accord with the values and the priorities of the kingdom of God? And what in a sense becomes false prophecy and indeed a, a false vision? And so it invites us in our own time to have our own visions and to dream our own dreams. A vision of our church, our congregation here at Christ Church. A vision of, of life on this island and, and beyond that. What is our vision? Does it have within it a sense of division, of suspicion, of enmity? Or is it a vision of enabled people to come together of different backgrounds with a sense of unity and harmony? Of enjoying one another's company of respecting one another's difference, of being tolerant of one another's different beliefs, a long way removed from that dreadful plight of the young Thomas Aikenhead. What is our vision for our own church, for our own society? To what extent does it align with the vision of the kingdom of God, which is central to the teaching, the preaching, and the living out, the example of Christ? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hymn 717, which may also be to a, a new tune, but enjoyed and liked by the choir, so we're going to go with it. Hymn 717, O Christ, the healer, we have come to pray for health, to plead for friends. Hymn 717. <laughs>
have to announce that during the course of last week, we lost one of our members, Marilyn Glyn Jones, who passed away in West Meath. There was to be a private funeral service later this week. Today, we remember her with thanksgiving and remember too in our prayers, her family and friends. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings to us in life, for all that enriches our lives, we give you thanks. We thank you for your love which surrounds us and for the love which we are privileged to receive each day. We give thanks for the fellowship and communion of your church and for the support that we receive from friends and from neighbours. We thank you too for the presence of your spirit in this your world, in the lives of their prophets and their proclamation of a society and of a world which was just and fair and reflected that unity and harmony which is your desire for all peoples. We give thanks for the life of the saints, for their example of obedient faith. But above all, we give thanks for the life of Christ, for his teaching with authority, for his healing, for his compassion, for his concern for all in their need. We give thanks for his example, which revealed your very nature and your being. And in his name now, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and our friends, wherever they may be this day and at this time, and ask for your blessing upon them, that they may know your peace. We pray for those whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time. For any who are ill at home or in hospital, for any suffering frailty and requiring the support and the attention of others, for those recovering from treatment or those receiving it still, and sadly for those whose illness knows no cure, for them and for their families, may they know the blessing of your peace. We offer our prayers too for any who are troubled or anxious, for those who feel lonely, though surrounded by others. And remember too those who have been bereaved, whether in recent days, weeks, months or years, but who live with that sense of absence at the loss of a loved one. May they too know the touch of your healing spirit. And we pray also for those unknown to us, but known and loved by you who this day suffer, those who suffer through the actions of others, those whose lives are dictated by an enmity and hatred which results in the terrorism and bombing, the war and the civil war, which so scars the beauty of this, your world. We pray for the victims of such terrorist activity for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have been injured and maimed, and for the millions too of refugees who have been forced to flee war and civil war. We offer too our prayers this day for the leaders of the nations, that their vision for their country and their nation in concert with others may be a vision which reflects the values and the priorities of your kingdom. May they and we learn to enjoy and celebrate diversity, to see how our different backgrounds, races and cultures enhance this very world in which we live. And may we better learn to live in peace, toleration and respect of one another. We pray too for your church, here in the world, through the lives of its members, to reflect your ways and your desire for all. May we be people of tolerance and respect of others, of care and of compassion. And as always, we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. May we never think them far away, for we share a communion and a fellowship with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have with you. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering, during which the choir will sing. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In 465, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. In 465.
And now go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always.